about shifting energy from negative to positive, one of the best ways to completely mess yourself up, mess your life up, mess your success up, is to blame. Blame is one of the most negative, disempowering emotions you could ever possibly carry with you. It is completely destructive. So, one really, really, really really, yes, really important thing to understand is that when you say, this person pushes my buttons, and we all say that, this person makes me angry, this person irritates me, this person frustrates me, this person tests my patience, all that person is is a catalyst to show you what's inside of you. And actually, they're your teachers. They're not causing you to become angry. They cannot cause you to become angry unless you have anger inside of you. Now, I want to tell you a wonderful story to illustrate this point. This, this is one of my favorite stories. How many of you want to hear a story, a really good story? As you know, I have a lot of good stories. Okay. This is a story about the yogi, or what in India we call the sadhu. Sadhu is like a, a holy man. Traditionally, the word yogi would be a holy man. The modern context is someone who practices yoga, who may not be so holy. But <laughs> traditionally, yogi man, holy man. So there's quite a famous story in the East about the yogi and the scorpion. So it's the rainy season in India, and there's little ponds everywhere where there normally are roads, and the yogi's walking through a pond. The pond's about 20 yards, 30 yards long, and he sees a scorpion. So the yogi, the sadhu, the holy man thinks, let me help the poor scorpion, because the scorpion is not a water creature. So he picks up the scorpion, and then what do you think happens? Right, scorpion bites him, and then what do you think the yogi does? <laughs> Throws the scorpion. But he throws him ahead, so that way he's closer to getting to dry land. And then Yogi walks, walks, walks through the water, finds the scorpion, picks him up again in hopes that the scorpion will understand that I'm trying to help you get out of the water, so it would be wise if you don't bite me. But again, scorpion bites him and again throws the scorpion out. And this continues till he finally gets out, uh, the scorpion gets out water. And there's a man watching him and he's thinking, I don't understand what's going on here. Why is this yogi continually picking up a scorpion who's biting him? It doesn't make any sense. He was very, very confused. So he went to the yogi and he said, I've been watching you and I have a question for you. I don't understand why are you doing that? And the yogi said, the scorpion taught me a very good lesson. Because I was trying to help the scorpion. And even though I'm trying to help him, what is he doing? What is he doing? Biting, right. So even though I'm trying to help him, he's biting. So I thought, if the scorpion won't give up his tendency, his nature to bite, why should I give up my nature to be kind even though he's biting me. Interesting, isn't it? Because what's inside of you comes out when you are tested. A lot of times you see people and they seem fine, great, but then they get in a situation and they're tested and the worst comes out of them. So it's very, 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 Yes, very important <laughs> that we understand when we're blaming someone for how we're acting, we're making a huge mistake because the person who is causing us to act in a particular way is only making us aware of our own deficiencies, only making us aware of where we need to work. So that person is actually our teacher. Have you ever heard the expression 
that if you really want to learn how to love, go live with somebody who hates you. Then you can learn how to love. Anyone who tests your tolerance is simply a teacher. How will you learn to become tolerant unless there's someone who can test it? As you may know, in our series on shifting the energy, one of the courses we teach is a course on forgiveness. And the most interesting thing about forgiveness when people take the course is they realize unless somebody hurts them, unless there's somebody to forgive, they never learn about forgiveness. And what forgiveness is do, does is, is a transformation of consciousness. It's an elevation of consciousness. So when people take a course in forgiveness, at the end of the course, they actually, within their heart, thank the person because it was that person who brought them to the point of learning how to forgive. So unless somebody hurts you, how will you learn how to forgive? So the person who hurt you becomes your what? Your what? Right. Your teacher. Very important lesson. Blame. It's for losers. It's for people who want to get stuck. It's for people who want to go to nowhere, whether it's in material life, whether it's emotionally, mentally, physically, or spiritually. Blame is for losers. Okay. I'm going to do another. Yes? No? Okay. So we've been talking about blame, and now it's time for a very very difficult quiz. This is a pop quiz. I know you weren't prepared for this, but I have confidence in you. Even though it's difficult, I think you can get the right answer. So, question number one. When you squeeze an orange, what comes out? Orange juice, right. Not mango juice, not grape juice, what about watermelon juice? Today would be a nice day for watermelon juice. No, when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. You guys are smarter than I thought. Okay, now the next question. A little more difficult. When you squeeze an orange, as you said, you get orange juice. So the next question is, why do you get orange juice? Right, because that's what's inside the orange. Yes or yes? You guys are smart. When you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice because that's what's inside the orange. Now, question number three. Question number what? Yes, just making sure you're awake. Okay, question number three. When you're squeezed, what comes out of you? Hmm, that wasn't a nice question, was it? What comes out of you is what? What's inside of you? Right. <laughs> if it's not inside of you, it won't come out of you. And what do we do? We blame the person who's squeezing us. Don't blame ourselves. It's not our fault it came out. It's the person who was squeezing us. It's their fault it came out. See how ridiculously stupid we are sometimes? Now, my spiritual master, he said something that is so interesting and so profound and so true. He said, the truth is so simple, you can miss it. The truth is so simple, you can miss it. And if you look at life, there's so many things which we call common sense, but as the saying goes, common sense is not so common. There are so many truths which are so simple and so obvious, they're so obvious, nobody notices them. Just like our eyelids are obvious, but we don't see them. So, everything I'm teaching you, it's so simple, it's so obvious. And when you learn it, then you realize, why didn't I understand that? Or maybe you realize, I did understand that, but I never do it, I never think about it, I never act on it. So, when you squeeze an orange, 
what comes out of the orange is what's inside of the orange. And when you're squeezed, what comes out of you is what's inside of you. So I want to talk a little bit about health. Because if you're going to be productive in any aspect of your life, I'm a spiritual teacher, but I help people use spiritual principles to achieve their goals in life. Of course, I teach that the ultimate goal is spiritual, but whatever you want to achieve, the same consciousness is necessary. So let's talk a little bit about health, because if you're not healthy, if you don't have energy, your mind's affected, your emotions are affected, you're not very productive in anything you do. So we're going to do a little test to see how old you are. So I want you to stand up. Everybody stand up. OK, stand up. And I want you to stand straight. And I want you to bend over. And I want you to see how far you can go. So, and then I'll tell you how old you are by how far you go down. It's that interesting way to, you know, your age is not your birth certificate. We're talking about how old you are. So, if you go like this and, oh, 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 you're like 85, 89, 92. If you're like here, you're like 106, 108. Well, maybe it was like here, you're 108. So, if you get down to here, then you're, you're getting like in your 60s or so, 50s, and you're getting down to your 40s, getting down to your 30s. And if you, which I haven't been stretching lately, so I don't think I'm going to make it below 30, but if you could get your hands on the ground flat like that, I can't do it today, then you're like in your 20s. So that's how you know how old you are. So you're all thinking, wait a minute. You know <laughs> the yogis. <laughs> These yogis are like 100 years old. And they're more subtle, subtle than a 16-year-old. So as you grow, your body, your tendons, your muscles, everything starts to shrink and shrink and shrink. So you all need to stretch and breathe. It's very important. In our society today, we do a lot of sitting, staring at computers. Right? Kind of. The only thing we move is our fingers. In traditional society, what do people used to do? They went out farming, shoveling, picking weeds. Picking weeds is good because you can stand straight and pick them like that, shovel like that, plant seeds, bend down like this, do all kinds of things. So when you're used to moving your body and stretching it, it's no problem. But when you're just sitting and not moving, then everything starts to shrink. You become dilapidated. The body's the only machine that gets better by using it. So we live a very unnatural life. So we're going to have gyms, and we have to do so many things to be active because we're sitting so much. So I just wanted you to be aware of the fact that if your body's tense, you can't stretch it, you know, this way, that way, this way, that way, everything's hurting. Oh, you're getting old, but you can actually get younger simply by moving your body and stretching. So, I, uh, and now, and I don't know if you know, but now Google in a lot of places, they do yoga classes. And so what you'll find is, if people are doing physical activity, they feel better. And then if people feel better, obviously, they get along better, they work better, they focus better, just, everything's just better. So if you want to be successful, you've got to be happy, and you've got to be healthy, and you have to be holy. So we're going to talk more about that. Just a little thing on health, just to like, get your mind going. OK. What I'm bringing to you, what I'm teaching you, is what I've studied for the last 45 years. But beyond what I've studied, 
is what I've seen and what I have experienced, and that's infinitely more important because I've realized that sometimes you study something and you think you understand it, but you don't. And it's only years later in your life that you understand it because you see it practically applied or you apply it in your life or you've seen it applied hundreds of times. And after the hundredth and sixth time, you finally get a, a little light go off in your head and say, oh, I never really understood that. So I want to bring to you a very important lesson. And I see very few people teaching this lesson, at least in the corporate world, it's not so well understood. Because what people focus on more are skills. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with skills, but there's something much more important. It's not just skills. It's the consciousness that's required for using the skills. And I want to give you a really, really important example. We're so concerned in the corporate world about teamwork and about getting along because it's essentially important and we should be concerned about it because if we don't get along, we're not going to go very far. We minimize our effectiveness, sometimes 50%, 60%, 70%. Sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot because we're competing with one another. We become uh, envious. We pull people down. We don't want to see people succeed. It's irrational and stupid, but we do it. So we go into the corporate world, we bring training companies in, and then we do team building exercises. We teach about communication skills, empathic listening, and so forth. All great skills, but just understand, if two people have a really good relationship, do you have to teach them listening and communication skills? If a man and a woman fall in love, do they need to go to a course on communications? Listening and, and speaking and revealing their heart? No. Because of their relationship, that's what they do. Now, years later, if the relationship goes bad, they'll go to a marriage counselor. And the marriage counselor may teach them the apathic listening skills. What's the problem? The problem is they may not want to use them, even though they've learned how to use them, or if they do use them, they're not in the right consciousness because they don't really care about that other person that much. So then they're using the empathic listening skills, but it's not working. It's just like, for example, let's say a man has a bad relationship with his wife. And he goes to a counselor, and the counselor says, listen, this is what you have to do. You need to bring her flowers. Every week, you need to bring her flowers. When you come home, you need to ask her how she's doing. And you need to touch her. You have to have some physical contact. You need to do that. If you don't bring the flowers every day, at least you need to ask her how she's doing. And you need to have physical contact. So he thinks, OK, that's a good idea. This is going to help my relationship. So he buys the flowers. He comes home. When he gets home, he takes the flowers and he throws them on the table. And he says, honey, I just got you some flowers. Sh throws them on the table. He goes up to her and he gives her a high five. How's it going, baby? And then she starts to tell him, how's it going? And as she's talking, he's walking away. Where is he walking to? Where do the men like to walk to? Sit in their little cave in front of the one-eyed bandit, the television. So she's telling him how her day went while his back is to her walking into the den or the living room or the lounge to watch television. So what did he do? He got the training. He has the skills, but he doesn't have the consciousness. Now, if that marriage counselor were a little smarter, if that marriage counselor was trained by our company, he would learn something different. He would learn that the consciousness is more important than the skill. And if you learn the skill and you don't have the consciousness, you may never be able to apply the skill properly. Or if you do apply the skill, because your consciousness is not there, it's not going to be that effective if you even apply it. What that counselor would have learned is if you can help this couple develop their relationship, use 
uh, to help change their perception of one another, help them appreciate one another. On the level of consciousness, help them connect automatically the listening skills, the communication skills, all the relationship skills that anybody could ever want to teach them, they will manifest. This is the key. And that's why a lot, a lot of trainings, they're really, really good. But three weeks later, what happens? Nothing. Why? Because you have to change consciousness. You have to change perception. And I'm going to tell you a story about how changing perception changes everything. People say, and it's true, people say it's difficult to change habits, or it could take 30 days. Some people say 30 days. Some people say 60. Some people say 90. You have to do the same thing over and over again. But my experience, 45 years of teaching, writing, and counseling, this is the more subtle level to changing, and something that's, that's much easier. And that's if you change how you see something. Because when you change how you see something, it's as if the thing you're seeing changes. And thus, your perception of that, because it changes, it changes your reaction to it. So just like, let's say, you see somebody and you think, that guy's a jerk. But if I could help you change your perception and see that actually he's not a jerk, but he's a, he's a wonderful person, he has so many good qualities, you just haven't seen those good qualities. Or you don't know what he's been through in his life that's made him a jerk. He may, if you found out what he went through, then you would think he may be a jerk, but most people who went through what he went through would have killed himself by now. So you change your perception. And when you change your perception, all of a sudden, what happens? You relate to him different. You experience him differently. So when we talk about changing habits, really we want to go to the level of changing perceptions, changing how we see situations. Like we were saying earlier, when a person tests your tolerance, you can see that person as a teacher rather than, this person pushes my buttons, I hate them, I don't want to see them. If I have to see them for one more minute, I'm going to throw up. No, here comes my teacher. Thank you for teaching me tolerance. Thank you for giving me a lesson. It's a change of perception. And now your relationship with that person changes. Something really, really important is how you see yourself. Because if you see yourself as a loser, if you see yourself as a person without confidence, if you see yourself as a, a person who has no intelligence or no skill, then that's how you're going to act. And the interesting thing is, what psychologists have found out, is the mind doesn't know the difference between what is real and what isn't. So if you, you could be extremely, extremely intelligent and extremely successful. And if your mind says, no, I'm stupid, I'm a jerk, I'm an idiot, that's how you're going to act, because that's how you perceive yourself. You cannot act in a different way from which you perceive yourself. So I want to tell you a story. Who wants to hear a story? Raise your hand if you want to hear a story. This is a really good story. So sit down and we'll tell you a story. Once there was a lion and his name was Kashi. What was his name? Kashi. So when Kashi was young, his parents abandoned him. So a lion when they're long, young is called a cub, right? Lion cub. Living near Kashi were a group of young baby bears. They're also called cubs, baby cubs. And those baby bear cubs adopted Kashi because they thought he was actually a bear. Because I don't know if you know this, but certain kinds of bears and certain kinds of lion cubs look almost identical. And so they thought he was a bear. So they adopted him. Now, as you might imagine, as Kashi was growing through youth into adolescence, he started to look different. And the difference became more and more obvious and disturbing. And the family decided that we cannot have such a mutation, retard, monster in our family. And so, unfortunately, they kick Kashi out of the family, telling him, there's something wrong with you. You are not a normal 
beautiful bear. You are an ugly bear. You are a retarded bear. You are a mutant bear. And there's something seriously wrong with you. So now Kashi goes back into the forest from where he came, living alone in the forest, and he's experiencing severe depression, which is one of the fastest growing diseases in the world today, especially in the developed world. The more the country is developed, the more there's depression. Hmm, wonder why. Very interesting. They don't have so much depression in the poor countries, only the wealthy countries. So anyway, so now Kashi is going through a severe state of depression. Why? Because he thinks he is a mutant bear, a retarded bear, a very strange, ugly, and weird bear. So one day, one saintly person was walking through the forest, and traditionally, at least in Indian culture, the saints, the renunciates, would live in the forest. They wouldn't live in the cities. The cities are not good places for their spiritual practice. They would go to live in a peaceful place, a place which is very calm and beautiful. So there was one sage walking through the forest, and he saw this depressed Kashi, and he said, My dear sir, may I ask you, what is wrong? You seem very upset. You seem very disturbed. And he said, yes, I am a mute, a mutant bear. I am a weird, ugly, mentally retarded, untouchable, unlikable bear. I have been rejected by my family and my life is depressing. And the the saint, the holy man said, what are you talking about? You're not a bear. You're a lion. Why are you depressed? I've never met a depressed lion. You ever met a depressed lion? I mean, what's to be depressed? You're a lion. You're like, you're the man. Everyone's afraid of you. Everyone runs away from you. You are the king of the jungle. So why be depressed? Kashi saying, no, no, you don't understand. I'm a retarded, mutant, weird, crazy, ugly, filthy, dirty, foolish bear. You ever said those things about yourself? A lot of people do. A lot of people say, I am stupid, I am ugly, I am foolish. Some people say, I'm retarded. And some of these people are beautiful, intelligent, and talented. So, the holy man says, Kashi, listen to me, Kashi. You are not a bear. You're a lion. Kashi, what are you talking about? Kashi, you were never a bear. You are never a mutant. You are never a retard. You are never an ugly bear. You were always a lion. So Kashi is looking at himself. He says, what do you mean? You're a lion. He's looking at himself. So you mean I was never a bear? No. You're never a bear. You mean I'm a lion? Like, <coughs> like I'm the king? Like lion and like king of the jungle? Yes. You're the king of the jungle. Oh, you mean I'm the king of the jungle? Yeah. And his head goes up. His chest goes up. Ah, yeah. I'm Kashi, the king of the jungle. Yeah. Rah! So now, as you can expect, Kashi is very, very happy because he realizes he's not a stupid, foolish, crazy, ugly bear, but he's actually a lion. That was a very quick therapy session, wasn't it? He went from depression to ecstasy in about three minutes, simply by changing his perception of himself. So what we need to understand, what's most essential and most important to understand is if you change perception, then you change the way you see things, 
and then you change the way you react to those things. Learning skills doesn't change perception, but if you change perception, automatically you will garner skills because of a new perception, a new way of seeing and a new way of dealing with things. This is such an important, such an important point, and I think many, many, or most of the trainers in the world today, they don't understand this essential point. And then we'll give you an example. You can do a sales training, right? So you get all your salespeople in, and you do a sales training. And you give them the exact same training. Do you think they're going to produce the exact same results? That's an easy question to answer because you know the answer is no. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the person who got more or better training is going to do better. Sometimes it does, but not necessarily. Because there's something more subtle than just learning what to say and how to say it and learning about the product and what it does and why it does it and why it's good and why it's better than the competition. You're dealing with an individual who may not believe in themselves. Or maybe they don't believe in the product and they can't sell it. Or maybe they think they're not a good salesman. Or they have so many beliefs about themselves that, that make it difficult to approach people. Now, people don't like to be sold things. People don't like to be called up. People don't like me to visit. People don't like sales demonstrations. They have all these negative things going on inside of them. So even though they have all the materials, they have the same thing that everyone else is giving, they don't get results. This is very, very common in seminars, particularly about seminars about wealth building. Because there's only a small percentage of people who go to those seminars that actually build wealth. Although everyone has the same tools. They're given the exact same tools. Why is it that someone succeeds and someone doesn't? Now you could say there are many reasons. Determination, focus, and, and um, priority, goal setting, and so forth. That's all true. But why is someone focused? Why is someone disciplined? Why does someone set the goals? Because they're not limited by beliefs. Certain people think money's bad. If you get money, it's, it's not good. You're a filthy person. Some people don't think they deserve to have money. And there's so many beliefs that, that hover around money that make it difficult for some people who have the skills and the intelligence to make it, to make it. And you'll always see that people who do well, who have a lot of money, don't have those beliefs. Because if they had them, they could never make money. Money's bad, nobody needs money, you know, it's just an entanglement and so forth. Those people never make money, no matter how hard they try. And if they make money, they lose it. Because in their mind they think money is bad. It's, it, if you have it, something bad is going to happen to you or you're a bad person. So we have to go to the most subtle levels to understand what creates success. It's I'll tell you one of my favorite stories. It's a story about consciousness. Now, one of the interesting things about consciousness is that in our society, everybody's trying to accumulate. Either it's things, stuff, power, success. It's, it's getting things. It's having things. But what people don't realize, or what we need to realize, or maybe people do realize it, but they don't practice it, is that it's not things that make you happy. It's consciousness. If you have a high level of consciousness, you're happy without things. If you have a low level of consciousness, you have everything and you're not happy. So, we want to learn how to elevate our consciousness. And elevating our consciousness is natural. It's who we are as spiritual beings. We are higher conscious beings. We have a lower nature, but we have a higher nature. A lot of people give in to the lower nature, and those people are very unhappy. But the people who elevate themselves, who go into the spiritual, the higher divine nature, those are the ones who are happy because they live in the world of love, they live in the world of compassion, they live in the world of peace, tolerance, forgiveness. And the people who live on the lower levels of consciousness live in the world of jealousy, envy, hatred, lust, greed, and those things. And if you're, if you're living on that level of consciousness, it doesn't matter what you do, you can't be happy. But the way you'll try to be happy is you'll try to forget your consciousness. You'll drink your consciousness away so you don't have to experience your hatred and your greed and your lust and anger. And then we call that happiness. And that's sick. If you have to numb your very consciousness to be happy, what does that say about your consciousness? It's something you're trying to run away from. And a lot of times people do things, they get into hobbies or they're workaholics, just to get away from themselves. So we need to deal with our consciousness. We need to elevate and purify our consciousness. That's how we're going to become happy. And I want to tell you a story about this, and I think you'll really appreciate it. 
So once there was a very poor woman. She had a little bit of land. She had a little shack on the land. And basically all the food she got to eat and whatever money she made was from her land. So one day she's farming and she finds, when she's digging up the earth, she finds a very, very valuable stone. And she recognizes the value of this stone and she realizes that this stone is so valuable that I'll never have to work again in my life. I can live now a life of plenty, a life of luxury. I can have whatever it is I need. And as a pious woman, she also thought, and I can help other people. All my financial problems will now be solved. Any conditions that I've had to deal with, with my family, with my health, now I have the money to deal with it. So she took this very valuable jewel, she put it in her bag, and she began walking away. And in the bag, there was a long, long loaf of bread sticking out. And there was one very poor man who came up to her, and as is the culture in India, they address women as mother. He said, Mother, I'm very hungry, can I have some bread? So she said, certainly. And she went to her bag and she broke the loaf in half. And she gave him some bread. And while she was breaking the loaf in half, he saw that jewel. And he said very boldly, he said, Mother, can I have that jewel? And what did she say? Hell no, what do you think you're doing? Ask me for that jewel. Get the hell out of here. Give me that bread back. No. She wasn't from New York. <laughs> the jewel, but the next day he comes back and he brings her back the jewel. And she's astonished. But more astonishingly, he says, I'm giving you back this jewel because I know you have something more valuable. And the woman's thinking, right, like I live in a little shack uh, on a small plot of land. All my clothes have holes in them. What are you talking about? What more valuable thing do I have? He said, yes, you have something more valuable. And I'm going to beg this from you. And I plead and beg you, give it to me. She said, what are you talking about? He said, I want what it is that's inside of you that enabled you to give me that jewel. That's what I want. And isn't that what we all want? Isn't it that we all want to be better? We, want, we all want to have a pure consciousness. We want to be able to be of service, to be aligned with spirit, to have divine guidance and bring that into our life. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what makes us happy? When you experience affection, when you show affection, you experience affection. When you show hatred, you experience hatred. Do you know what Buddha said? Buddha said, you're not punished by your anger. No, he said, he said, excuse me. Buddha said, you're not punished for your anger, you're punished by your anger. When you get angry, you punish yourself. Isn't it a fact that we do an excellent job of punishing ourselves with anger, with jealousy, with envy, with greed, with resentment? I hate that person. Who are you punishing when you hate somebody? I'm going to tell you an amazing story. Who wants to hear an amazing story? OK, I'm going to tell you an amazing story. Hold on. We did this, we did this seminar training. And one of the things they teach you to do <coughs> is you say something. You just talk in your normal voice. And you want to make a point. You walk to the front of the stage, and you yell it out, and you just go, you say, you know, isn't it, isn't it crazy? Isn't it the fact that we're our own worst enemy? And then you silence, and then you go back, and you say, isn't it true? <laughs> I did that once. The whole audience was like, anyway, that's another film. OK, so we're going to tell a story. It's the potato story. How many want to hear the potato story? Raise your hand. OK. Once a teacher told her students, I'm going to give you some homework. And your homework assignment is that 
for every person you hate, I want you to write their name on a potato. So if you hate 10 people, you're going to get 10 potatoes. On each potato, you're going to write their name, and you're going to put it in a bag, and you're going to bring it back to class. So everybody came the next day with their big bag of potatoes. Now some guys had like really big bags because they hated a lot of people. And some only had like one or two because they didn't hate people. Well, some people actually hated nobody. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't think of anyone they hated, so they had nothing in their bag. Anyway, so then the teacher gives the assignment. Now you have your bag, and this is what you're going to do with your bag. How many want to know what you're going to do with your bag? Raise your hands. Okay, this is what you're going to do with your bag. You have to carry that bag with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. So this kid's got 25 potatoes. He says, I have to carry this bag with me every day? And the teacher says, yes, 24 hours a day. When you sleep, when you eat, when you play, when you go to school, when you bathe, whatever you do, you have to carry the bag of potatoes. Can you imagine carrying a bag of potatoes everywhere you go? So nobody liked that assignment. Everybody was really upset. The teacher said, you have to do it. So every day, they were complaining. It got worse and worse. Could you imagine carrying so many potatoes with you every day? You go crazy. And then if you bathe with the potatoes, they get wet. And after a while, the potatoes get wet. They start sprouting, spudding, budding, and smelling. And then you have to sleep with smelly potatoes and eat with smelly potatoes. Plus, when you're going playing cricket, you have to carry your potatoes somehow. How do you, how do you play cricket with potatoes? That's really, really a problem. So the students were complaining every day. So finally, the last day, after seven days, they come in. The teacher says, now you can put your bags of potatoes down. And they all put their bags of potatoes down, and they all made a sound. What sound do you think they made? Who knows? Ah. So everyone was very happy. Big festival. We could put our potatoes down. Because there's a moral to the story. Who wants to hear the moral to the story? OK, the moral to the story is the teacher said, this is exactly what it's like when you hate people. You carry them in your heart wherever you go. You carry the weight. You carry the burden. You carry the toxicity and the smell of hatred wherever you go. You know, if you hold something like this, let's say you have five potatoes in a bag and you hold it like this. And I say, hold it like that. So, no problem. Not very heavy, just a few potatoes, right? Maybe a half kg, quarter kg. If you're holding that for an hour, does it feel heavier? If you hold that for a day, does it feel heavier? It's the same weight, right? It's the same weight, but it feels heavier. So when you carry hatred, it's a burden. And every day you carry it, it weighs you down more and more and more. And they say that resentment it's one of the heaviest burdens people carry. You carry it on your back. So, consciousness. We get to enjoy our own consciousness. Now, what if the teacher said, think of somebody you love and carry that person with you. How would you feel? You'd feel very good. But isn't it a fact that we do something really really stupid. What do we do that's really stupid? This is one of the stupidest things we do. Somebody does something to disturb us. Somebody does something to hurt us. And what do we do? We think about them all the time. All day we think about this person who hurt us and disturb us. Have you ever done that? Somebody bothers you? It's like the whole day you're thinking about them. Is that stupid or is that stupid? You're right. It's stupid. You're thinking about a person who bothers you. Why do you want to think about a person who bothers you? And then the more you think about the person, what happens? The more upset you get. The more frustrated you get. The more discouraged you get. It doesn't make any sense. Why do you want to think about someone who just frustrates you more and more and upsets you? It's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. This is what we do. Successful people don't get bothered by people who disturb them, by people who put them down. Do you know, if you ever become really successful in your life, there are going to be a lot of people who become envious of you who don't want you to become successful. 
there's a saying, that's a really nice saying. If you become successful, you're going to get a lot of false friends and a lot of real enemies. If you become successful, you're going to get a lot of false friends and a lot of real enemies. You have to expect that. But successful people don't allow people who put them down to disturb them. Some people are going to need to put you down because they don't feel comfortable when you're successful. Don't let it bother you. If you let it bother you, then you're being stupid. Then you're carrying that person in your mind. You know when you hate somebody, you carry them with you everywhere you go. That's really stupid, isn't it? That can never help you. So think about it. There's so many people to disturb us. There's so many things going on in this world to upset us. But if we're smart, we're not going to carry those situations or we're not going to carry those things with us. We're going to just let them bounce off of us just like you're wearing a raincoat and it's raining and you stay dry. Very important lesson. There's a very, very important principle. Very important principle. And the principle is this. Never compromise your principles. Warren Buffett said, when you hire somebody, you want to look for integrity, you want to look for energy, and you want to look for intelligence. You want to look for what? Integrity, intelligence, and energy. And he said, but if you don't have the first integrity, then the intelligence and the energy are going to destroy you. Because that person is just going to destroy your company because they don't have integrity. They just have intelligence and energy and it'll be misused. So, integrity is a principle. You have principles. You have things which you value, which you believe, things which are right. In Sanskrit, in India, we call this dharma. Dharma means what is right, right action, what is given by sacred literature, what is given by holy men. That is dharma, that is right action. It's always right, it always was right, it always will be right. Just like fire is hot, it's always hot, always was, always will be. There are certain things that are just right, they're natural, it's the way things work. That's dharma. And dharmic principles are meant to be the guidelines by which we operate. So my spiritual master lived by these principles. What my spiritual master did was quite amazing. He went to New York in 1965 and he had a message which was based on a book called the Bhagavad Gita. And the message was a message of spirituality. It was a message of self-control, discipline, consciousness elevation. And he was preaching that to a group of hippies who were not about self-control, who were not about discipline. What were they about? They were about drugs, sex, and rock and roll. That's what they were about. And so, he came into that environment and he said, don't take drugs, don't eat meat, and don't have sex unless you're married. Married, which is, no one ever said that. And if, if you were to bet your money on that message making it in 1965 in New York or San Francisco, I don't think you would invest one penny in a bet like that because you'd think a holy man going into the hippie world to tell them don't take drugs and don't have sex that isn't going to work. And he said in those days he said this was my message this was the teaching it's a tradition this is the Dharma this is the way to live. This is the best way to live and that's my message and I will never compromise that message to get followers to get success or money. Because if I do, then the message is watered down. I've lost the purpose. I lost my mission. I've lost the why. So he said, I was prepared to fail. Now, we need to redefine success because everyone looks at success in terms of what you achieve. But from a spiritual percep perception, a spiritual perspective, success is not what you achieve. Success is what you do. And the results may come or may not come. But you do the right thing. And then whatever comes, you accept. It's a very interesting concept. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna, fight, do your duty, whether you succeed or fail. Now, who's saying that in the world today? Do what you do, whether you succeed or fail. No one's going to say that. This is a much more subtle consciousness. This consciousness is duty because it's known if you do the Dharma, if you do it right, you'll never fail. You, and even if you so-called fail externally, you will grow. You'll become greater and greater. And as you become greater, what you do becomes greater. So he said, 
even if I don't make one disciple or get one follower, I will not compromise my principles. That's Dharma. And what happened? He got many followers. In fact, he got thousands and thousands and thousands of followers who followed those principles, believe it or not. And he opened, in his 12 years in the West, before he left this world, he opened 108 temples. And he had about 20,000 people worldwide working for him. And he didn't pay anybody. Interesting, isn't it? Who gets 20,000 people to work for them and doesn't pay them anything? How do you do that? Interesting, isn't it? You follow Dharma. That's your success. So, why you exist, why you do something, that's most important. And don't ever compromise your why. There's a story, many stories in our movement, with my spiritual master and his spreading of his mission, where he had so many chances to compromise principles because a situation looked like we could achieve something really great if we just kind of compromised here and compromised there. He never did it. And he knew if he compromised for short-term goals, he would lose in the long run, and he never did it. And even Sir Richard Branson said the same thing. He said, same thing. He said, never compromise your integrity for short-term goals because in the long run, you will lose. So it's a very important lesson on integrity and not compromising your principles. You know that my company, Soul Tools, is a spiritual self-development company, and you may be wondering why we've brought it to the corporate world. Well, many people have come to our workshops for their own personal self-development, and they told us, you should bring this to the corporate world because it's needed. And I didn't really think about it much. And they said, no, there's a lot of negativity in the corporate world. People come into corporations, they're not really prepared for what they have to deal with. They don't have communication skills. They, they, they're blaming, they're irresponsible, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very negative. So we were told over and over again, there's a lot of negativity in the corporate world. And your spiritual teachings can help them. And I was thinking, spiritual teachings in the corporate world, it seems to not really work. But then I began thinking about it, and I began searching on Google and finding that, that many, many organizations are imbibing meditation practices, yoga, prayer, <clears throat> and other spiritual teachings in the corporate environment. And in fact, that I read that many corporations are not letting this information out because it's helping people so much they don't want the competition to know. And some of you may know they have a thing called spiritual quotient. We have a, a, emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, intellectual intelligence, and physical intelligence, or physical quotient. And emotional quotient, emotional intelligence came out in the early 90s, and that was like the next big thing because people realized intelligent people are not always successful. People who have skills are not always successful. They need to have interpersonal skills. They need to have, know how to deal with one another, and they need to know how to deal with themselves. But then later on, they came out with, the, they discovered the spiritual quotient, that meaning is even more powerful. What motivates people is purpose. Why? What can I give? What can I create? What can I do to actually contribute to make the company better, to, to utilize my skills and talents, and fulfill a higher purpose? So that's the spiritual quotient. So then I started experimenting with, with direct spiritual teachings and how they would apply in a practical level. And one of, the, one of my favorite teachings is the teaching about ego. Ego is, of course, taught in many religions. And the way we understand ego is a false identification. We think we're better than we are. We think we're the greatest thing that ever hit the world. We have a need to be right. Everybody has to listen to us, do what we say. We have to have, we have, to have control, power. And that just doesn't work. And one of the things, one of the biggest losses I see in corporations, and it really disheartens me, and I see it often, you have many, many really skilled, intelligent people with fantastic ideas. And those ideas never make it to ears that will listen, because the ears that could listen think, I'm smarter, I've been around, I'm older, I know what's going on. And a lot of those good ideas end up leaving that company because the people working for the company are frustrated that their ideas are not being heard and listened to, and they start their own companies. So that's unfortunate. Or maybe it's fortunate for the person who started the company, but it's unfortunate for the company. So spiritual teachings are highly based 
are founded on the principle of ego. Ego is a false identification, and that false identification is a physical identification. I am the physical, when actually we're the spiritual. And when you understand you're the spiritual, a lot of the ego things start to dissipate. And what are the ego things? Is I need to be right, you need to do what I say my way, and I cannot listen to another idea or opinion that doesn't agree with, my, with mine. How many times have we seen that? And how destructive is that? And if we just raise ourselves a little bit in consciousness, we raise ourselves to a more spiritual level, what happens? On that spiritual level, we can listen a little better. We can be a little more open. Our false ego kind of dissipates enough energy to allow us to connect more deeply with people, to develop better relationships. One of the most powerful things in any organization, any group or any company or corporation, is, is the team, how well the team works together. And false ego is re really a huge impediment in bringing people together. So you can do team building exercises, but what you need to do is ego deflating exercises. Team building exercises without ego deflation, it just is not gonna be effective. Because that's the problem, that when you deflate the ego, people get along. I want to tell you two stories. Uh, this is, these are really important stories because they actually come from real life. And I don't like to teach a lot of theoretical stuff. I like to teach what I've seen. I like to teach what works in the real world. So what I've seen over and over and over and over again is where relationships are good, organizations succeed. Where in some organizations they're just good, it's just the right people and they all like one another. In other organizations they work on the relationship. But whenever there are bad relationships, often I see is the people only relate in the business environment. They never relate any other way. Whereas if you do things where people relate more in a leisurely or recreational way, they bond more deeply. And when they bond more deeply, obviously relationships get better. And when relationships get better, People work better together. They like working with one another. So for example, there was one company and there was a lot of strife and difficulty. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. One, one department doesn't get along with the other department. One person doesn't get along with the other person. So what the CEO of that company decided to do was invite everyone to come for breakfast every day. Don't eat at home. Come to the company. I'll pay for the breakfast. It's a small company, so they could do that, about 30 people. He didn't try to do any kind of team building exercises. He didn't do any kind of training and communication and trust and this and that. He didn't try to teach any principles about working together and so forth. He just brought them together and had them have breakfast every day. He did that for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, every relationship problem was solved without any training, without any intervention, just by relating to one another on the level of friendship in a more relaxed environment in which there was no discussion of anything about business, just personal talk. Another friend, similar environment, he manages a company, and I said, what do you do to deal with this disharmony, this lack of cooperation? He said, I took them out camping and every night, we put two people, different people together, so everybody got to know one another really well. And when you get to know somebody, generally, you get to like them. You see the good in them. And when you get to like somebody, what happens? You work much better with them. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, if I don't like somebody, it just means I need to get to know him. So, really, really important. And what you'll find is when you deal with relationships very personally, out of the hierarchy, just on as camping or at breakfast. Nobody's up here, nobody's down here. You create an ego-free environment, and when you create an ego-free environment in, or, in an organization or a company, things just take off. Ego-free environment, that's the real, the real key words here. That's a spiritual principle, but you see how effective it is within organizations on the material level. So the principle of soul tools is if you get it right spiritually, you get it right every other way. We are physical beings, emotional beings, mental beings, and spiritual beings. And if you line them up, starting with spirit, then the mental, the emotional, the physical, they line up. And then everything works well. 
That's the dharma of spirituality and how it affects on the material level. Now when you talk about spirituality, people are saying, well, is it religion? What if I don't believe in religion? It's different. It's not about religion. It's about universal principles that operate on the spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional level and how they work in, in, in interactions with people. And when you follow them, things just go well. So that's a little bit of history on soul tools and how soul tools works in the corporate world. So we just finished the workshop today and um, we had some questions people are asking about how does spiritual, you know, the idea of spirituality, that I'm a spiritual teacher. I was actually a monk at one point in my life and then how does that relate to the corporate world? And I had to think about this a lot because I never related it to the corporate world. I was only, I've only related it to our, our organization and our organization is basically spiritual. But when more I thought about it, I thought, for example, every day of my life, I meditate for two hours, which requires a tremendous amount of focus. And focus is such an important factor in achieving success. Every success guru will talk about focus. Don't do a million things. Do what you do well. Do what's important. 80-20 principle. You get 80% of your result from 20% of what you do. So focus is it's, it's unlimitedly important. So, so who's the best person to talk about focus? Somebody who meditates every day for two hours requires tremendous focus. They know about focus. Then we look at self-discipline. How important is self-discipline in achieving success? It's essential. So when I was a young man, I became a monk. And I, I practiced one of the most difficult things, I think, for any young man to do. So I practiced celibacy, became vegetarian, I gave up drugs. And for a young hippie in California, giving up drugs was kind of a big thing. So I know something about self-discipline. I've had to keep up this level of discipline throughout my life. I rise early every morning, two, three, four in the morning, every day. I exist on less sleep than most people. I exist on less food than most people. I'm extremely productive. I've, I've had to be productive as a monk. And so I can show people how to be productive because of my spiritual side. So the spiritual side, it's very, very powerful. And if you go down to the list, go down to the list, spiritual people are more tolerant. How important is tolerance? Spiritual people are more patient. How, is important, how important is patient? Spiritual people have better relationships. Good relationships are essential in any organization. Bad relationships are destructive. You get good people with bad relationships. They're destructive. You get intelligent, smart people that can't manage themselves. They're not self-disciplined or controlled. They don't do much. They spend their time dwelling on negatives, talking negatively. Spiritual, spirituality is something which is very positive. When people focus on negative, they become discouraged. It drains their energy. Spiritual people are very optimistic, very happy. Now, another interesting thing they found is that 75% of your success is based on your optimism, your ability to support people, and your ability to get along and take responsibility, not based on your skills or your intelligence. So corporations are always looking for skills and intelligence, but that's not what makes a person successful. So the spiritual skills are the actual skills people need to be successful. If they don't have them and, and they just have general skills and good intelligence, they're not going to be as successful as someone who has more of the spiritual skills. So that's, that's a little bit of the history of the development of soul tools, of why we can be so effective in a corporate environment. Even I didn't graduate from Harvard Business School. Actually, my qualification is I dropped out of university. That's my qualification. You say, what qualification is that? Well, it's good enough for Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. It's good enough for me. It's good enough for a lot of others. In the subsequent years that I dropped out of university, that's when I learned everything about life. University, I was living in a bubble. But it was real life experiences that showed me that the people who were the most successful, were the most balanced, even if they didn't know they were spiritual, they were actually following spiritual principles. And eventually, they came to that level of spirituality, or they had it in their past. They had it in their upbringing. They had it somewhere implanted through the culture, through their family, through friends, through the popular culture. So that's why Soltos is effective, and that's why it's unique, because it deals on a different level. 
It's not on the level of just skill training, but it's on the level of changing consciousness. And that's the most important. And when you change consciousness, you change perception. People's results change. Because you would think, unless a saintly person has a degree from Harvard Business School, how is he going to be of any use? To corporation, what does he know? He's just living in, in, as some mystic yogi in the forest or in a holy place. So what is the value? Well, it's an interesting question. And my spiritual master is the founder of the Hare Krishna movement. And he developed the Hare Krishna movement very, very rapidly. And as he was developing it very rapidly, opening many centers around the world and many people were joining, businessmen, they would always be inquisitive. How is this happening? What is he doing? Because, because whatever he's doing is working. But he never told anybody what he was doing. He told very few people what he was doing. But when you actually analyze what he was doing, he was just being a sadhu, but applying dharmic principles to an organization. And those dharmic principles are universal. They always work. And you know, now in the corporate world, it's always the latest idea. What's the latest idea? The seven this, seven secrets of this, the seven habits of that, the this and the that. There's always something coming that's new. And then another new one comes, replaces the old one. The dharmic principles, they're universal. They were found in our Vedic scriptures thousands of years ago. They still work. The principles that Ram followed, Lord Krishna followed, the sadhus followed, they work. They work in every aspect of life. So corporations is really just like a big family when you look at it, like a big kingdom. So what principles work? I think from the organizations I've worked and from watching what my spiritual master did, the thing that was most important was that people would be happy and inspired and get along. And the latest research, research shows that the most successful people are the happiest. It's not the other way around, that when you become successful, then you become happy. It's the other way. When you become happy, when you, become happy you become successful. So when you elevate people spiritually, they become happy. And, and then they're inspired. And then they get along. Then they're more self-controlled. They're more disciplined. Their intelligence works. And they do things for the right reason. Now, it's, it's interesting because something, you and I could do the same thing, but we have totally different motives in doing it. And so the higher your motive, the more pure your motive, the more you'll be successful because it's more dharmic. Now, religious people understand that. They understand if you do something dharmic, you're going to get the highest result. That's why they give charity. That's why they don't just make money and spend it on themselves. They give it to build temples and, because they understand this money has to be used. It's a dharmic principle. So that's where the sadhu comes in. He gives vision. And in the work I do, so much of the work I do is in counseling people, people in companies who aren't getting along, who aren't productive, who lack self-confidence, just counseling them by, by helping them understand their spiritual position, helping them become free of a lot of impurities within their heart that they've gathered in this life and many lives. And the results are tremendous. So it doesn't seem connected directly that you would give some, you know, a meditation process is going to change the productivity of a company, but it does because people are, are more peaceful. Stressful people are not productive. So when people meditate, they're less stressful. And they're more connected with purpose because they connect with God. And it's all about purpose. And purpose is your, where your motive comes from. If you just go to work and it's a drudgery and you hate it, how inspired can you be? What are you going to do? You look for every opportunity to not work. But if you come from a more spiritual perspective, it's a it's perspective of integrity. You're actually motivated for a more divine reason. That this is your dharma, like Arjuna. What motivated Arjuna? It was dharma. Krishna said, this is your dharma, do it. He said, I don't want to do my dharma. He said, no, you have to. And when he finally realized dharma was everything, he did it and he was fine. So you realize this work is my dharma. It has a divine connection. You'll be more inspired. So actually, I would say sadhu has the most essential place in a company. And companies that bring in the teachings of sadhus are the most successful. As backward and, un and in or unintuitive as it sounds, it's true. <laughs> how, do you, how do you recognize a real sadhu? Yeah, it's like, like my spiritual master said, if you want to recognize counterfeit gold, you have to know what real gold is. A real sadhu, it goes back to motivation. Sadhu's motive is to help people. In our Vedic culture, in traditional society, the Brahmins were the guides of the kings. Why? 
Because king's motives may not always be dharmic, but the motive of the Brahman is always pure. Right? So the Brahman, the sadhu, is the one whose only motive is for the welfare of the people. That's his interest. So a sadhu will not come to exploit. It's not about him. It's about the world. And that's why when you have sadhus influencing companies, it's not just about profit. They care very much about the people in the company. They care very much about their influence on the planet. Because business can do amazing things to help the planet and help people. And they can do horrendous things to destroy the world. So that's also why you need sadhu, because sadhu has the intelligence and the humanity to guide a company based on integrity and principles so they won't compromise their principles to make a few extra dollars in the short run and destroy relationships, destroy the environment, and so on. So we say, bring the sadhus into the environment. And that's why we call our work corporate sadhu, bring the sadhu. Bring the cool sadhus into the corporation. Bring the corporate sadhus into your company, and they'll do major shifts. Just like the sadhu knows about vastu. A few shifts in vastu can make a big difference, right, in a company. Just moving the desk this way, facing a different direction. It's all about energy. So when there's a lot of, the sadhu raises energy. Do you know that there's studies in consciousness that show how one sadhu, a very highly elevated person, can change the energy of a whole company? One person, that my spiritual master, he changed the energy of so many people. Vice versa, someone of a very low consciousness can bring a whole company down. So, that, so how do you know a sadhu? He brings you up. And he doesn't do it for name or fame or for money. He does it for genuine need to help people. You agree? Yeah. And we can all, and the other thing that's interesting is everybody can be a little sadhu-like. It's a sadhu is not just for some renunciate, but every employee in a company can imbibe sadhu-like qualities. When Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita, it was for everybody. He didn't speak to a sadhu, he spoke to Arjuna. And he describes all the qualities which relate to the spiritual position, the spiritual level of life. Honesty, balance, responsibility, spiritual practice, kindness, and so forth. These are qualities we're all supposed to imbibe. They're, they're natural to us. Our, as spiritual beings, we have them. So a sadhu will bring out those good qualities. And the more good qualities people demonstrate, the better the organization will be. And, and what's interesting also is you can tell people to have these good qualities, but you can do processes which bring them those innate qualities out. It's not artificial. It's there. You just bring it out of people. That's the, that's the good news. It's not something short-lived. That's who they are. They have these qualities. So you bring it out of people, and then they live on that level. Then everything changes. If you try to just change it through knowledge or some skill training, it may not work. Or it won't work long because it doesn't go deep enough. But if you actually get to the heart, to the spiritual level, it's already there. You're just bringing it out. You're not implanting some new habit. It's already there. This leader is, um, I think the leaders really need the guidance of the sadhus. Because the idea of the sadhu or the brahman is the one whose intelligence is clear. Because he's only thinking about the welfare of the people. He's not thinking about getting anything from himself. He can give the best advice. And that's our tradition. The Chanaka Pandit, your Chanakas, they're giving the advice. You know, every great king had great advisors. So that's the role of the sadhu, to give advice. And, and the advice that they would give is establish dharmic principles. Help elevate people spiritually. It's, it's not a question of instituting one religion and pushing out another, but it's an, it's an institution of dharma. I think one of the great failures to our society, to our children, is that we don't teach them enough about character. We're just trying to mine skills that can be employed in industries so that they can make money and companies can make money. And it's so unfortunate that they don't develop character, which is the basis of education. And that's a, that's a duty of politicians. It's 
very important duty, that education becomes more spiritually and character-based. And then you raise a higher quality of population. And, and as you elevate the, the population, then you see the culture changes. You know, we're, we're, looking at, look, we're looking at all these problems in society today, and it's so much worse than it was 20, 30 years ago. Why? Is it just, it just you enact laws and it's going to change? No, you have to change the individual. It's a good question because it'll apply to everyone. The question is when, you, when your hands are tied in certain areas and you have high ideals, but circumstantially there's, there's factors which are going to limit what you can do, how, how, do you, how do you go about it? What do you do practically? And what should your attitude be? So you should never give up your ideals. There's, there, but, but you have to deal practically with it. So you do the best you can in the situation that you're in. But you try to inspire people. You see, the, see, the thing is, people get inspired by purpose. By why? By higher vision. So you, a good leader has a vision which inspires people. A bad leader can't inspire anyone. So you want to be able to communicate a higher vision, a higher purpose, because then you get people to work with you instead of for you. If they're just working for you, it's just, it's just obligation. A leader is one who gives vision and inspires people. What inspires people is why. Why does the country exist or why does the company exist? I mean, you, you get purpose, you get essence. For example, in a lot of companies, nobody even knows why they exist, so there's nothing to be inspired about. Or, what, 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 is, what, do we, what do we want to do as a nation, as a people? So a leader gives it a vision that's more elevated than the vision of the common man. The common man just wants to eat and sleep and be happy. So that's not so inspiring. So a leader gives higher vision to, to make the country better, to become like what, what Mr. Modi's doing. He wants to create a spiritual influence. That's a higher ideal. So we're going to have to convince people that may not be easily convinced. So it starts there. So we don't, we'd never give up on our ideals. Never, ever, ever, ever. Now Churchill said, democracy is a horrible form of government, but it's the best one we have. So you're tied. Your hands are tied. In any situation, your hands are tied. You can do a little more in companies, because companies are more autocratic than democratic. But governments, they're difficult. But great leaders inspire people to come on board with the vision. So as, as an individual leader, we have to do that. And as an individual, we never give up our vision. And then we deal practically. And there's another really important factor. This is called the super soul factor. In Bhagavad Gita, it's described Atma, the soul, and Paramatma. And Paramatma is the super, what we call the super soul. That is God within us. That is our source of intelligence and source of inspiration. So when we come to a situation which seems to be dead end, dead ended, we don't know where to go, whether to turn right or left, that's where prayer is important. Turning to God within us for guidance and intelligence. So all of us have the capacity to get this guidance, this, you could say unlimited intelligence is, is within all of us. And prayer is extremely important. Spiritual practice is important because that connects us more with God. And He can help us. He can give us vision. He can give us intelligence. He can give us knowledge and attitudes that we need to do what seems impossible. And every great person has thought out of the box. They don't do what everyone else thinks. Does. They don't think the way everyone else thinks. If they do, they're never great. And so where does that intelligence come from? It comes from a desire to do something wonderful. That's the seed of it, but it ultimately comes from Krishna or from God. The real sadhu will be assassinated because he'll, he'll want to establish... Society has... He'll want to establish dharma. He'll want to, he'll want to establish what's right. And, and society has become degraded. So the people are becoming, they're, they're not dharmic based, they're just pleasure based. If it feels good, enjoy it. And the sadhu is going to give higher principles. And so, if people follow the sadhu, then everything will be very wonderful. People, as my spiritual master was asked this question, he said, people will be happy, they'll be peaceful, because they'll be living a more natural life. I mean, look at life in our cities. Everything. Everything we could ever possibly want to achieve, we're getting the opposite result. We've got more health care and less health. We've got more money and less poverty. We, it's all, 
It's all become a paradox. We have more technology and less happiness. And less t we have more technology, but we have less time than ever. My father went to work at 9 o'clock and came back at 6. Who goes to work at 9 and comes back at 6 now? We didn't have the technology in those days. We didn't have the, the time-saving devices. Now we have all the time-saving devices, and we don't have any time. So if a sadhu is a president, a prime minister, that would all get reversed. Everything, everything would go back to what's more natural. If you study the way nature works, it's just amazing. If you study natural systems, it's amazing. And we're disrupt, disrupting those natural systems. Asada will put those natural systems back together. The stress levels of people today are incredible. The, the amount of depression today is increasing more than ever before. It's all because of modern convenience of life. This is what it's creating. So Sada will take people back to a more natural way of life. It's like what I like to say, he'll take us in a full circle. We'll go, we'll go forward. How do we say? The Sada will take us forward to go backwards. He'll take us forward to go in the past. He'll take us forward. The forward thinking will take us in first full circle. We'll get us back to our past, to our roots. But we didn't have the pollution. We didn't have the depression. We didn't have all the disease and the poverty that we have today. So he'll take us forward to the past. You see that in America, in the West. There is a resurg resurgence of many things that were popular 100, 150 years ago. Natural medicine. Farming, living off the land. 150 years ago, half the Americans lived off the land. Now it's maybe, what, 10%, 20%, 5%, 1%? There's a resurgence, a full circle going back to the land. The sada will take us full circle. But people may resist that because they'll think it's going back to something primitive. The sadhu is so calm and shanti, peaceful. Why is there conflict amongst the sadhus? Yeah. Con conflict is due to impurity. Conflict is due to provincial consciousness identification with the clan, with the particular race. And that is a material aspect of consciousness, which is absent in the pure sadhu. So on the highest level, there's only unity. And to the degree that we fall from that highest level, then there's power struggle, which is the human condition. So we are spiritual beings, but we're implanted within a physical body. And due to past samskaras or impressions, still calm, crowed, lobe, moha, matsar, the lust, anger, greed, it has its influence. So on a good day, the higher nature has its influence. On a bad day, the lower nature has its influence. So sadhus are also works in progress. But like my spiritual master said, if someone's dirty and they're in the shower, don't criticize them. So the sadhu is trying to purify. But until the sadhu is on a very, very elevated level, they're still dealing with those desires and those impurities and that's the cause of, of the fighting that's the cause of the um, provincial consciousness that that our group is better or different than your group uh, we don't like your group we like our group that's still material consciousness because the real sadhu is not is not going to degrade his consciousness into conflicts if a sadhu is going to enter a conflict, he's only, only going to enter a conflict because, because if he doesn't, it's going to jeopardize the well-being of people. And so he must enter into that conflict, not motivated by his own bad habits or his own impurities, but motivated solely by the need or desire to solve a problem for the benefit of people. Otherwise, otherwise he's detached. He's not going to do it. It's not for himself. Then, then the, so he's saying it may look like it's for himself, not for himself, but it may be. So sadhu means introspective. The sadhu has to be very much in touch with their own motivations. And anything pure can be contaminated, and anything contaminated, contaminated can be purified. So it's not just because someone is a sadhu does that certify them as pure. It can be misused, and it is misused. As an American, one of the most misused things I find in Indian culture is the culture of respect. 
it's a very good quality that in India we respect elders, we respect teachers, we respect elder brothers, parents, and sadhus. But the difficulty which contaminates the system is that the person demands respect without commanding. If the person commands respect, respect, the system works. If the, if the person doesn't command respect but demands it, the system falls apart and then the system is exploited. And this is happening. And it, it is, it's a real travesty. And many innocent people are exploited in the name of honoring a sadhu. Put a real sadhu, he'll be assassinated because he'll, he'll want to establish, society has, he'll want to establish dharma. He want to, he'll want to establish what's right. And, and societies become degraded. So the people are becoming, they're, they're not dharmic based, they're just pleasure based. If it feels good, enjoy it. And the sadhu is going to give higher principles. And so, if people follow the sadhu, then everything will be very wonderful. People, as my spiritual master was asked this question, he said, people will be happy, they'll be peaceful because they'll be living a more natural life. I mean, look at life in our cities. Everything, everything we could ever possibly want to achieve, we're getting the opposite result. We've got more health care and less health. We've got more money and less poverty. We, it's, all, it's all become a paradox. We have more technology and less happiness. And less, we have more technology, but we have less time than ever. My father, went to work at 9 o'clock and came back at 6. Who goes to work at 9 and comes back at 6 now? We didn't have the technology in those days. We didn't have the, the time-saving devices. Now we have all the time-saving devices and we don't have any time. So if a sadhu is in, a president, a prime minister, that would all get reversed. Everything, everything would go back to what's more natural. If you study the way nature works, it's just amazing. If you study natural systems, it's amazing. And we're disrupt disrupting those natural systems. Asada will put those natural systems back together. The stress levels of people today are incredible. The, the amount of depression today is increasing more than ever before. It's all because of modern convenience of life. This is what it's creating. So Asada will take people back to a more natural way of life. It's like what I like to say, he'll take us in a full circle, we'll go, we'll go forward, how do we say, the sadhu will take us forward to go backwards, he'll take us forward to go in the past, he'll take us forward, the forward thinking will take us in first full circle, will get us back to our past, to our roots, where we didn't have the pollution, we didn't have the depression, we didn't have all the disease and the poverty that we have today. So he'll take us forward to the past. You see that in America, in the West. There is a resurg resurgence of many things that were popular 100, 150 years ago. Natural medicine, farming, living off the land. 150 years ago, half the Americans lived off the land. Now it's maybe, what, 10%, 20%, 5%, 1%? There's a resurgence. A full circle going back to the land. The sadhu will take us full circle. But people may resist that because they'll think it's going back to something primitive. Yeah. Con conflict is due to impurity. Conflict is due to provincial consciousness, identification with the clan, with the particular race. And that is a material aspect of consciousness which is absent in the pure sadhu. So, on the highest level, there's only unity. And to the degree that we fall from that highest level, then there's power struggle, which is the human condition. So, we are spiritual beings, but we're implanted within a physical body. And due to past samskaras or impressions, still, calm, crowd, lobe, moha, matsar, the lust, anger, greed, it has its influence. So, on a good day, the higher nature has its influence. On a bad day, the lower nature has its influence. So, sadhus are also works in progress. But like my spiritual master said, if someone's dirty and they're in the shower, don't criticize them. So, the sadhu is trying to purify. But until the sadhu is on a very, very elevated level, they're still dealing with those desires and those impurities. And that's the cause of, of the fighting. That's the cause of the um, provincial consciousness that, that our 
group is better or different than your group. Uh, we don't like your group. We like our group. That's still material consciousness. He, the real sadhu is not, is not going to degrade his consciousness into conflicts. If a sadhu is going to enter a conflict, he's only, only going to enter a conflict because, because if he doesn't, it's going to jeopardize the well-being of people. And so he must enter into that conflict. Not motivated by his own bad habits or his own impurities, but motivated solely by the need or desire to solve a problem for the benefit of people. Otherwise, otherwise he's detached. He's not going to do it. It's not for himself. Then the, so you're saying it may look like it's for himself. Not for himself. Not for himself, but it may be. So sadhu means introspective. The sadhu has to be very much in touch with their own motivations. And anything pure can be contaminated. Anything contaminated, contaminated can be purified. So it's not just because someone is a sadhu does that certify them as pure. It can be misused, and it is misused. As an American, one of the most misused things I find in Indian culture is the culture of respect. It's a very good quality that in India we respect elders, we respect teachers, we respect elder brothers, parents, and sadhus. But the difficulty which contaminates the system is that the person demands respect without commanding. If the person commands respect, respect, the system works. If the, if the person doesn't command respect but demands it, the system falls apart and then the system is exploited. And this is happening. And it, it is, it's a real travesty. And many innocent people are exploited in the name of honoring a sadhu. Yeah, so the question is where to find a real sadhu. And say, contact corporate sadhu. <laughs> we'll, send a, we'll send a real sadhu to your company to make real changes that no trainer no Harvard PhD is going to be able to make. A sadhu can make a change, a real change. And it, it, the real answer to your question is what's a real sadhu? Is a real sadhu is one who can make someone else a sadhu. That's the real sadhu. So when we send our sadhus to your company, we change people. We're change agents. That's what we do. And a sadhu can change people. And as I was saying, this is documented. A high consciousness person affects, affects the brain, the way your brain works, this is documented scientifically. It's called mirror, mirror neurons. There's neurons between us that affect one another. This is a perfect example, perfect description. We're working on a more invisible level. Usually you're working on visible level, but behind the visible is the invisible. And that's where the problems start. And that's where the creativity also comes. So you have both the good and bad on the invisible level. So when you work on that level, then everything changes on the visible level because it all starts on the invisible level. Just like when you water the roots of a tree, you get fruits, but the fruits are invisible. What they say is it's the glacier philosophy. You know the glacier philosophy? The glacier philosophy is where there's a glacier in the ocean, you only see 25% of it or 15%. The rest of it's underneath the water. So the mass, the mass of the glacier is underneath, you don't see. And that's the cause of the 15% you see. So what's going on underneath in people's consciousness in their life is affecting what's going on in the workplace. But we don't see that. And that's where we, as corporate sadhu, we come in and that's what we manage. We even do a workshop on marriage. and say, like, why would you do a workshop on marriage in a corporation? Because your marriage affects your work. And if you have difficult time at home, you bring it to work. And you're not as productive. And it becomes difficult for you to get along with people because you're disturbed at home. So it's a very unique approach, the teaching a marriage workshop in a corporation. But it makes a dramatic difference. When we help people balance their lives so they become better people. And when their lives are balanced, they become better workers. They're easier to get along with. And, and so many of the of the leadership coaches said it's extremely important when you have toxic people in a company, you have negative people, you have to be able to turn them around or get rid of them. So soul tools is really the process, I mean corporate sadhu is really the process for getting the best out of people and purifying people who are very negative and making them positive. It's very important that everyone understands that whatever you do 
whatever you think, whatever you say, has an effect on everyone around you and has an effect on the world. And when you look at the world, you see so many bad things going on and you think, I didn't have anything to do with that. It's not true. We have much more to do with what's going on in the world. It's a karmic influence. So we have a motto. If you uplift yourself, you uplift the world. And so when we ask the question, can I really do anything to make the world better? The answer is, you are the only one who can do anything to make the world better. So spiritual practice, which sometimes may seem selfish, it's just between you and God, it's never selfish because it elevates you. And as you elevate yourself, everyone becomes elevated. So it's a duty, it's an obligation, it's a dharma for every one of us to elevate ourselves. If we're not going up, we're going down. And as we go down, we bring people down with us. Now look at the world. It has been said that we've destroyed the world more in the last hundred years than we've done in the history of mankind. And we want to change that. How can you change the external world unless you align it with the internal world? It'll never happen and it'll never be sustainable. That we have to become internally the way we want to see our world externally. This is a point that, that people don't fully understand. You can talk about what we need to do to be, to be more ecologically friendly and green, but you have to be ecologically friendly and green in consciousness. Otherwise, and if we don't pass that down to the next generation, even if we get it together, they'll destroy it. So what have we given? What have we given? What are we giving to our children? The idea that the more is better, bigger is better. The idea that somebody hurts you, you take revenge against them. That's what we're giving to the world. That has to change. That's destroying the world. It's the consciousness of people that's destroying the world. You go to a movie, what's their movie about? It's about somebody who was hurt. And the rest of the movie, they take revenge. They kill, they steal, they lie, they cheat, they do whatever they have to do, they take revenge. So that's what we're giving the next generation. If you're hurt, take revenge. That's what we're passing on. Where's the movie that you're hurt and you forgive? We don't have those movies. Why? Because they won't sell. Right? Where's the movie about Dharma? The couple gets married, they stay together. That's not going to sell. <laughs> that, that would be boring. But that's what we need. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to hear about. That's what we need to teach. So uplift yourself, uplift the world. That's my message. You can't do it any other way. It won't happen. Don't wait for someone else to do it. It doesn't happen that way. Go. So I have a question for you. If you were God, what would you do? How would you live? How would you act? Now you think, you're God. That means you have complete control of everything. You can create universes. You can create people. You can create planets, houses, cars, you can get people to act exactly the way you want them to act. You can do anything. You can destroy people also. What would you do if you're God? Now, if you think about this, I'm going to help you think. But if you think about it, what would you do? You would create friends. You would create loving relationships. You would create beautiful living facilities, beautiful environments, beautiful sounds, smells, scents. Why? Why would you create that? Ultimately. You just want to share love. We all, we're made of love. We just want love. We want to be loved and we want to give love. So I think we could say if, if we were God, we would want to give love and we want to be loved, loved. We would be about relationships. Okay, so if that's true, now, let's take this one step further. What about God? Don't you think he wants relationship and has relationship? Don't you think he gives love and wants love? If we want it, he wants it because we're, we come from him, we're created in his image. So think about it. Whatever we'd want, God wants. Whatever we would do if we were God, he would do also. It gives us an insight into the nature of God as a person, as a being, as a sentient being with feelings, who wants love. Now some people can say that would make God incomplete. But love is the highest. Love is higher than truth. Love is higher than philosophy. Say, philosophically, God's complete. He doesn't need anything. Love is higher. 
Even though he's self-satisfied, love is higher. He still wants love. It's the greatest need. That's God. And he wants our love. My love, your love, all of our loves. He relishes it. He desires it. So in Buddhism and, and Hinduism, it describes that the world is temporary. It's a, it's a place of suffering. It's kind of a, you could say, depressing thought, miserable thought. We want to be optimistic. We want to see the world in a, in, a, in a proper way, in a positive way. So I want you to think for a moment. Everything about this world you don't like. I don't have a flip chart here, but imagine I have a chart and we're going to write down everything about the world you don't like. You, know, you may not like it that animals are slaughtered. You may not like it that women are not well respected in certain cultures or countries. You may not like it that people aren't vegetarian. You may not like it that your grandmother has cancer or anybody has cancer. You may not like it that the air is polluted, that the seas, the oceans, the rivers are polluted. You may not like it that you have to get older than 25. I mean, if I could stay 25, that would be a lot better, I think. 30, 35 maybe, max. And just so you start thinking about all the things in the world you don't like. You can imagine that list would be kind of long. The weather, it's too hot, it's too cold. Politicians, people, situations, cities. All right. Now let's imagine we're going to make another list. God hires you to make the world. You can make the world any way you like it. How would you make it? How would you, what would you do? Would everybody get old and die and fight? I don't think so. We wouldn't make it that way. We'd stay young. We'd stay healthy. We'd stay loving. Air is clean. River is clean. People get along. There's no war. The earth is plentiful. It's not exploited. It's not poison. You go on and on and on and on. And now you compare the two lists. And then you, you start to see realistically what this world is. It's not an ideal place. It's not the place we would create. And it makes you question, if, why is the world like this? Why did God allow the world to be like this? And it makes you question, did he create another world that's different, that's better? I mean, the world we want to create, nobody's going to die, right? I mean, you don't want your brother, your mother, you, you want to be with them forever. Did he create a world where nobody dies? Where there's no unhappiness, where there's no suffering, there's no pain. Did he do that? And why didn't he do it here? Think about it. Next time, we'll, we'll give you some more insight. Oh, Hare Krishna. Krishna.